Um, so I'm really, really happy to be here. Thanks a lot. Um, I, um, I don't know how old you think I look, but I, when I was 16, I went to be an exchange student in Belgium. Um, and I turned 17, though, while I was there, but in, for spring break, um, I, won, I, I was one of the kids that didn't have any money while I was in Belgium for the year, between 85 and 86. And uh, so then we started hitchhiking everywhere. And uh, so the place I really wanted to visit was uh, Prague. And so in uh, April of 1986, I uh, hitchhiked to, uh, to Nuremberg, and then I got the train about midnight, and it got to Prague in the morning. Um, and it was just the luckiest day, really, ever. And I, while I was there, I, I bumped into an American guy on the street, right? And he said, well, where are you staying? I said, well, I'm just a backpacker. I don't have any money. And I suspect the guy maybe had a girlfriend or something. Uh, he was the U.S. He was the uh, U.N. Uh, the U.S. labor representative in the United Nations. And he was staying at a beautiful hotel uh, downtown. So he just gave me the key to this hotel. Uh, he said, I think I have a hotel and I'm not even staying there. So I wound up staying in a five-star hotel with my backpack for several days uh, in April of 1986. Uh, so I'm very happy to be back here. Thank you for bringing me back. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I wish I could uh, stay longer. Uh, but I have uh, numerous things going on now. I, I think a little bit about myself. Uh, I did international relations after that uh, in university. And I really like to travel, so I spent time in, in the Middle East and Africa. Um, I started in U.S. government work in 1993 uh, as a French linguist. Um, and uh, um, eventually, by the late 90s, I had worked my way into a cybersecurity role because uh, I was at the National Security Agency. And basically, um, there was a lot of pressure to do more tech things for everyone, right? Even if you were, I was very soft skilled, so I was doing French uh, translation. Um, but then I had a lot of opportunity to study uh, for free because I had a job with the U.S. government in technical things. So I took HTML and website security and computer to computer communication, introduction to programming, you know, the Java, etc. And uh, so I never got good at any of them, uh, but I did like to write. So my thing then became just writing reports. Uh, so I really do enjoy that. Um, and especially with technical folks, right? With technical people, technical ideas and such. But because I was already in the U.S. government, and um, I wound up moving into a job basically studying Chinese hackers. Uh, Chinese uh, hackers stepped up, penetrated the United States, um, the Pentagon, which happened basically every day. Uh, so then once you started studying it, you, you saw that the problem was such that you know, data is literally constantly flowing, let's say, out of the Pentagon, to China in this case. Um, and there was a lot to write about. It's very interesting, you know, who are these people or, and what, what are they looking for? Um, it, it's a fascinating story, really. I mean, just one example is the F-35 uh, jet fighter, which is um, the most expensive weapons program in U.S. history, which probably makes it the most expensive program in, in history. Um, and the, the plane may never fly, right? May never fly. Why? Because, uh, you know, the Chinese hackers have been inside the program from the beginning, stealing things, um, and who knows what they may have changed, right? Why would you change parts of the front of the plane so that, well, as the United States and China prepare for war in the Pacific, uh, you know, they're prepping the battlefield. They're constantly sort of getting ready to win the, some potential war. Uh, and part of that, what you might do then is replace parts of the system so that when the American fighters take off from the, uh, the aircraft carriers, they don't get a chance to do that. Then yeah, they pull the trigger and nothing happens. Right? Why does nothing happen? Well, it's because the code has been changed so that China would have an amount of service capability in the event of war uh, over the United States. 
uh, in that particular part of that. Uh, so this is all very interesting, I think. Uh, and one of the things about it is it was so hard to stop the hacking, right? It's uh, when you take very professional hackers and um, average defenders, which which uh, what you will find in a state versus non-state role. Um, you know, I assume that the White House and the CIA are fairly hard targets, right? But, you know, the, the electricity grid in Kansas City or the water treatment in California, you know, they're going to have, by comparison, mediocre cyber defenses. Um, you know, maybe even just one guy, right, who does security as an extra task on their work. Um, and, and then what you may have on offense is, you know, the Russian or Chinese or Israeli or French or something equivalent of the CIA and NSA. Uh, so it's hardly a fair fight, you know. And another thing about cyber attacks is that w w when it's for espionage, let's say, um, there, there's no, there's no penalty for uh, for losing or for failing. Right? You can literally try every day a different combination to see if it works. Kind of like it's, it's a, uh, a block uh, pick uh, artist that has no, uh, no, no physical penalty for, uh, for failure. Because it's via the internet, it's across jurisdictional boundaries. Right? Um, so, so that makes it a really tough problem to solve. Uh, and that's why even you know the you know Obama and the, the premier of China recently were trying to figure out how to limit hacking between uh, China and the United States. And I guess um, they have probably some some, uh, some secret ways to do that. You know, I assume the United States gave a list of you know um, malware and IP addresses and hacker groups and. Uh, company names, perhaps, Boeing or something, that uh, they're particularly worried about. But it's, it's, the fact is, is it's hard to stop, uh, because there, there are literally, so I worked for a company called FireEye before moving, I'm in Ukraine now, and I'm sort of jobless, uh, my, my wife is a diplomat, so I, I basically, that makes me sort of free to, you know, to write articles and drink cognac and uh, try and uh, find uh, meaningful work to do. Uh, but as you can see, so I'm teaching my first course at the, uh, the, uh, the National University of Kiev, and uh, I also do work for NATO, the book, which I'm going to talk about, uh, in the council, and then I do some work for, some contract work for U.S. US companies, one in particular that looks primarily at social media, so anything related to the security of social media. Uh, as it turns out, there's just too much to look at. So uh, I've written some things for them. The next thing I'm going to write, they've got, they're collecting a lot of data on financial scams via Instagram, right? So I don't know uh, if you're on Instagram. Basically, I'm not. But basically, they, they uh, my kids are. Uh, but, but basically, there's just too many ways, I guess, to try and uh, fool someone online, right, in, in order to uh, uh, gain uh, fit money. Uh, but in a national security sense, you have to imagine all the possibilities. It's really incredible. Uh, anonymous, for example, anonymous says anyone can be anonymous, right? Um, so do you think intelligence agencies or military groups would like to be anonymous for a day or two here and there in order to accomplish tactical goals? And for sure, uh, you can see that in many uh, scenarios. So. Here's the, the research. Uh, NATO sort of approached me uh, the, about eight or ten months ago. So I'm kind of proud of this. We have our book launch on Tuesday in Estonia. And, um, and they said, well, what about Ukraine? You happen to be in Ukraine, so could you do something on the cyber dimension of the uh, conflict there? And so I thought, well, this is perfect, right? Because the, the general you know, idea is you should have um, you should have something to look at. So then I started asking researchers, and almost no one said no. So I, I you know, they just, a little bit of background, they just, well, how about, you know, if we give you 11,000 euros, can you just do something with that? 
so you'll see some of the bigger names on the list. They got a thousand euros to write the, the, the chapter. But basically, then everyone else sort of sort of clusters around the bigger names, uh, and we got a, a research team. I could have been larger. Uh, but basically, I have 17 authors. I wrote sort of the introduction, uh, and then what we looked at is is well, you have a hot military conflict, so. Uh, where are we in terms of seeing cyber war? Uh, so I'll definitely share that. That's a little bit of background on me uh, and on this book. On the, on the title, um, I had asked for uh, cyber war in perspective with an idea of just kind of taking a case study to sort of see uh, better uh, what cyber war really looks like in practice. Uh, and then analysis from the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, but I think NATO was interested maybe in, in highlighting the, uh, the Russian role a little bit, a little bit more. So, so that became part of part of the title, which is the Russian aggression. Uh, um, the, the, the cover um, we hired somebody in Estonia to do the cover, and uh, they, it was a little bit of a surprise. I expected it to be look like Maidan or something, you know, the protests against the uh, former government there, but they. But the guy said that he used the Tron video game uh, early on. The idea was well, that we're starting to see um, geography in cyberspace. So one of the things that I always uh, like to write about is you know, the idea basically that in cyberspace you have a reflection of everything that happens sort of in the real world. Um, and so if you're a student, um, you know, when I was a student, you know, you actually went to the library and looked through books, you know, late at night, one by one page by one page. Um, but today, I guess that's not the way students operate anymore. Uh, and you know, if you think about it, you can, you can search an academic database for a topic, then sort by citation count, then search by keyword. Uh, so it has to be, uh, it's a lot more efficient, and so that's great for students and professors, uh, but the same thing applies to, to spies and soldiers and scientists, right? So, uh, so, the, so that's always very interesting just to see the reflections of it. And, and uh, no matter whether you're a student or a spy, right, you should see reflections of their activity, their interests, their research, always uh, in cyberspace. And, but one of the interesting things about it was that there's one cyberspace, one internet, Right? So now we're sort of all in the same field, and everything, you find a big fat and high connection on the internet, and you'll find literally everyone uh, doing every type of thing, which is also very fascinating. If you have access, of course, to that type, uh, then, you know, then the possibilities literally are, are, are endless. But anyway, that's a bit of background on the, the, uh, uh, the book cover, which is a little bit of a surprise, but it's always teamwork, right? Uh, it's, a, it's kind of neat. Uh, in this case, to see sort of the the uh, the, uh, the teamwork effort. Uh, but as so we walk through this stuff, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that as well. Um, so you know, so just a couple of boring slides with no pictures. But the the, um, the, the idea of uh, cyber security and its connection with national security. Uh, you know, has led to, well, countless Hollywood movies, but also endless streams of, of government and national security people warning of cyber war. Um, now, it's to the extent that uh, now we're worried of government overreach, right? I'm sure you've heard of Edward Snowden. Um, and part of, I guess, the story, the Snowden story is that is that for the NSA and the NSA equivalents around the world, it is just much easier to collect everything, right? Uh, and then you dive in as, as you mean to and as the rules seem to allow. But, but at the beginning, it just seems that you should theoretically collect everything. And the idea there, let's say, you know, there's someone who, who is suspected of being a spy, right? Then the law enforcement can go back and they can say, well, here is her telephone calls, her emails, and her chat messages over the past 10 years. And, and they, they can easily see, um, you know, historically, uh, what, uh, what she has been doing. Um, and so there's no, and, and that really facilitates the, the, uh, the investigation process, let's say. But it also has real implications for democracy and human rights, etc., because if 
uh, now you know that the government's collecting all of your information all of the time, uh, and so that is going to lead you to behave differently in life, right? Um, can I do this type of political research? Can I vote for this party? Um, can I look into this human rights issue? Uh, that sort of thing. Because if the government's watching you all the time, then, then you have fears of uh, some kind of political influence and political control over all of your, your activities and your, your, your thoughts. Uh, so that has ramifications. Because uh, so, I can say I worked for NCIS. I don't think there's a TV show you may have seen. NCIS is an American TV show. I worked for them for, for 12 years, apart from the time in, in NATO, where I was sent by them. Um, you know, but I can say that law enforcement and counterintelligence professionals even, it's difficult for them, very difficult. They're even made up of lawyers and, and smart technical people. It's difficult for them to stay current with the law uh, and to implement the law properly. Uh, so yeah, I can say firsthand that mistakes will be made, right? Unfortunately, that's just human uh, existence and uh, uh, it creates a challenging space, though, I think, for when you put too much power in the end. It, so, like, it's a bad enough problem in the United States or Czech Republic, but there's a lot of countries where we know the human rights record is very low and very poor. Uh, so, the internet is great for communication and sharing ideas, uh, but it's also great for surveillance right? and for sort of this idea of total surveillance, 24-7, 365. Um, so that's, that's part of the challenge. Um, so in Ukraine, we have this issue of, this is where NATO was interested. Uh, so you have a hot military conflict, clearly. Uh, Russia and Syria, uh, Russia and Syria, Russia and Ukraine uh, are, are really engaged in a very high stakes geopolitical game. Uh, they also have a strong STEM background, right? Scientific technology, engineering, and math, and experience with computer hacking, we know, uh, criminal groups, and uh, the effectiveness with which the Russian government appears to use uh, computer hacking. You'll see numerous US officials saying that Russia has the best hackers in the world, uh, etc. I did a research paper in 2004 on uh, Russian hackers, and so I did some interviews for them. And some of the Russians I talked to, they said, well, uh, in, in America, the hackers are very soft. You know, they're used to programs and um, uh, high-level programming. But in Russia, you know, we're used to building things ourselves. So if you the light breaks or toilet breaks in our house, we fix it ourselves. We don't fault someone. We actually know how it works and how to fix it. Uh, he said the same thing applies with computer code and computers as well. Uh, we fix them ourselves, we build them ourselves. Uh, and uh, since the average Russian, he said, can't afford a, uh, to buy a Microsoft Windows, or Microsoft Office, uh, we break the security wrappings and we, we use them anyway. Uh, but we've learned that over time. It's very interesting. And uh, some of it too is, is uh, maybe the, the Cold War sort of difference in philosophies as well. Anyway, those are some of, some of the issues that I wanted to look at. Um, but still, the, there's numerous cyber war uh, uh, skeptics, and there's certainly many questions out there. One of the ones I really want to look at for the, for the book uh, is whether sort of uh, computer hacking is playing an active role on the battlefield uh, and it's uh, effective, essentially. Because there's so many analogies. I'm on, for, for example, I'm still on the, uh, the National Security Agency uh, academic team. So I'm glad I'm out of government now. I like being in, in academia and doing sort of uh, more public things. Um, but one of the books we've put together um, over the past couple of years, and there's a, there's a, I can give it to you if you want, there's a the beta version. It's called Cyber Analogies. Um, but we're doing it. Double the number of staff, including the, uh, for example, David Zenger, who's the New York Times journalist who did all the Stuxnet reporting. And Stuxnet is the uh, sort of the Western uh, cyber attack on the Iranian nuclear program. So he wrote the book on that. Um, there, uh, so we look at analogies, right? But the the, uh, the 
the question is, is, is um, how valid are they? There's numerous people in the book who write on uh, Cyber Pearl Harbor analogy. Um, because the idea with cyber attacks is that you could, in theory, like Sun Tzu says, win a war before it even starts. Uh, because everything today relies on computers and networks to operate. So if two tank armies are on the battlefield, and one of them has a zero-day exploit, right, to shut down the operating systems of the opposing forces, and this is, of course, theoretically quite possible, uh, then the other tanks, just like in the, uh, the fighter plane uh, story I told you earlier, they can't even move, right? They just sit there, dead, and the other tanks will right past them or destroy them on the way. Um, so, uh, to, you know, to what extent uh, are, are, um, are cyber attacks being used on the battlefield, and are they changing sort of the, the nature of, of the warfare? Another issue we really looked at is the peacetime use of cyber attacks, because here's, here's one of the challenges with cyber war, is you cannot wait until uh, the war starts, right, to hack. It's going to be too late at that point. You have to go in peacetime. Uh, and so this, I, I went to one talk in Las Vegas a few years ago, and the speaker was the director of the CIA. And so he asked the group, he said, well, why would it be better, why would it be preferable, uh, morally, to bomb a factory from the air with traditional bombs than to hack it? Because some of the idea with cyber warfare is that um, it might be a more humane form of warfare because if you decided that, that uh, you know, the war was over for some diplomatic or political reason, then you could simply turn the systems back on and the electricity functioning, etc. But the CIA director, he said, well, why, why might it be better to bomb the factory traditionally from the air with the airplanes and bombs than to hack it? And nobody said anything. He waited for a couple of minutes. Uh, and then he said, the reason is, is because the president, in this case, of the United States, could choose to bomb the factory today, and it could be bombed today. He said, but with computer hacking, you actually, he said, you're talking about months, if not years, of painstaking subversion of the security uh, during peacetime of the, the factory. Uh, and it, this creates all kinds of moral and legal dilemmas during peacetime, right? So this is why this talking about international norms for cyberspace in terms of military and intelligence operations is very important, very interesting. Um, so the book, uh, then, I, what I wanted to be more so than about Russia, more so than about Ukraine, I wanted it to be a look at where we are today, 2015, from the standpoint of uh, integration of, of uh, use and abuse of computer code, hacking, cyber operations, information warfare, in a digital sense, uh, today. So, uh, so I tried to organize the research as logically as possible. Um, I had 17 authors. Um, like I said, at that point, we said, well, this is probably enough. Uh, we tried to fill in holes as well as we went. Uh, logic, holes in logic. But this, I don't know if you follow Russia that closely, but he's a well-known Russia author uh, based in Oxford. And he agreed to write sort of the, the regional story. So it's the chapter two or the chapter number one after uh, the introduction, uh, in terms of explaining the background uh, on, on the ground in Ukraine, right, what's going on there. Uh, if you just look at you know, Ukraine, it's obvious to any observer, uh, I like maps a lot, uh, why Ukraine is important. It's also why Syria is important, for example, uh, you know, in, in a certain sense. It's right in the middle, it's on the crossroads between east and west, um, it will be, you know, to some extent, a, uh, a battleground, right? If only ideological, uh, in a sense, uh, because it occupies a place sort of between Russia and the West, in serious case, you know, between the Arab world and the Western world, between, uh, you know, in the religious sense as well there. 
Um, but the, uh, so here Giles, he, he writes about uh, the difference. And so I asked my students at Kiev the other day this question. I said, you know, please cross-examine our logic. Um, I said, you know, to what extent, and these are you great in, uh, kids in my class, I said, to what extent do, do you know, does Russia and uh, Western Europe have different philosophies on, on life and, uh, you know, work and, and all of them said absolutely, fundamentally different. I was a little bit surprised at that, but, but that all of them said for sure. Um, so, I don't know if we can talk about that later if you want. I don't know if it's that important right here, but um, uh, at this juncture in the lecture. But, uh, but that was interesting for me to hear. Uh, and this expert on Russia also says uh, the same. But in particular, in, in, a, in a political military uh, sense, the challenge is, is how to deal with former Soviet states that, uh, that Russia is uh, is worried about uh, from a, uh, a threat perspective, I would say, as well. Um, the question is, is fairly deep, I think. I don't know. There was, in the, in the journal Foreign Affairs, there was an ongoing, about a year ago, discussion about this, in which the US, uh, one former US ambassador to Russia, thoroughly uh, tried to counter argue against this. He, he says that he was involved in every top level meeting between the US and Russia for a decade. And never once did the question of NATO enlargement come up in, in closed doors. So he feels like it's all propaganda. Um, but, uh, but in any case, there is no doubt that there are geopolitical issues uh, between them and, and Ukraine falls in the middle. Um, uh, between the uh, between East and West, and for me, I'm not an expert on Ukraine, but uh, I live right really on the Maidan. I'm lucky because you know live in, in, a, in a U.S. government housing there, uh, and the uh, um, to get a million people onto the streets of Maidan, uh, you know, just a, you know, roughly a year and a half, two years ago, uh, in the middle of the winter basically to tell the president to leave. I mean, that's such a significant event uh, that it seems, uh, and it seems almost that, that it had to be a strategic decision as a population you know, was made to, uh, to ask to politicians to orient policy toward the West rather than toward, toward the East. Um, so anyway, uh, there are plenty in the chapter, and this book, by the way, will be free to download on Tuesday from the NATO Cyber Center in Estonia. Um, the, uh, there are plenty of tactics that Russia has in terms of leverage, and cyber now is one of them. Uh, but the question is, is, is how, how uh, it's being used today and how serious. I also, just so you know some background, I moved to Estonia in 2007. If you remember that story, Estonia wanted to move this Soviet statue uh, from the center of town out. You know, because for Estonia, it was sort of a symbol of the Soviet Union. The Estonians and the Russians don't get along very well. Uh, and so then there was three weeks, basically, of uh, large-scale distributed denial of service attacks against, the, uh, against Estonia. So I moved and I lived there for four years, basically the Pentagon sent me there to study the issue and then to help build the NATO cyber center um, at that time. So I also brought in a character, uh, this he's probably our most senior, I guess, academic on the team. He's the dean of the Naval Postgraduate School in the United States, and I asked him to write the global context here. So um, if you saw this in the news, the United States and China were just meeting on this uh, a few weeks ago, how to handle uh, hacking, interstate hacking, and computer network operations. Um, and with, I, I can say from my own personal experience, as you already know, that, that this is a real challenge, sort of the uh, Chinese companies basically hacking American companies, government 
attacking government. Uh, some of it, I think, goes back to the size of China uh, and the scale and the speed with which it's developing. So that's, that's just something the United States has to deal with from a, the biggest strategic perspective. Um, the country just will graduate many more um, uh, graduates in science and technology than the United States has you know, in the entire country uh, every year, just due to the size of, of the country and India as well. Uh, and the speed with which they're growing that it's, it's really no surprise that you're going to see a lot of hacking in business as well. Um, so, the, uh, this chapter also talks about the, the, from the standpoint of where cyber falls into national security plans and programs, uh, and the need to, uh, to develop sort of legal and bureaucratic framework around them, will help with this problem of attribution. So the attribution problem in cyberspace is a lot of times you just don't know who is attacking you because they can route their attacks through a different uh, uh, path every time, right? So I worked for a company called FireEye before I moved to, uh, to Ukraine. And one of the things we looked at, and this is just one company, right? So I asked my company, because I was just, as an analyst, I was supposed to write geopolitical reports for them. Um, you know, because I'm not a hacker, or voter, or reverse engineer, I'm a report writer. So I said, well, give me all of your, there's these things called malware callbacks. So a callback is, uh, like if, if, there, if this machine here, my laptop, is compromised by a hacker, the hacker needs to know that it's compromised, and that it's still compromised, and that they have some rights on my machine, and that they can go in and steal data, or use it as part of a larger operation. So my, my computer then will call back to a, a server that the, uh, the hacker owns, right? And that's basically called a malware callback. So FireEye then gave me about 30 million callbacks over an 18 month period, just to examine from a geopolitical perspective. Uh, and it, it, it's very easy to find the reflections of geopolitics in the data. So I, I went and gave, there's a big uh, conference in Las Vegas called Black Hat. So I went there in the summer of 2014 with 30 million of these callbacks. So basically, before I went, I just did two examinations of the data uh, based on real world hot wars to see if I could find. Now, um, you don't need to know what's in the data. This is basically, it was a look, for example, there's something called traffic analysis. And in traffic analysis, you don't need to know what people are talking about to know that it's important, right? Um, so in the Pentagon, for example, it used to be said in the Cold War that journalists would basically camp out in front of the Pentagon at night um, just watching. And if there were ever more cars, more pizza deliveries, more lights in the windows, etc., well then they're tipped off. They know something is going on. They don't know what's going on, but they know to pay more attention to world affairs, perhaps that night. Maybe some country is going to get invaded, uh, right? Um, so, you know, the, the same thing if your spouse is communicating, you know, to your neighbor, all of a sudden in, in incredible spikes of, uh, you know, uh, sort of leisure time communications, uh, they either have a new friend or a new lover, right? Uh, so you might want to check that out. Uh, this is traffic analysis. You don't need to be able to see that communication, but the, scale, the volume of it, the direction of it, um, is telling, right? So anyway, back to the malware communications. What I did was I said, okay, this was 2014. Uh, I'm going to give a talk in Las Vegas at Black Hat in August. So I just looked for that year, basically. And I looked at March 2014, when the Ukraine conflict was at its most intense. You know, you had actually Russian troops on the border, Gazprom was threatening to, to, uh, to cut off the supply of gas to Ukraine. Russia annexed Crimea, there was a big military operation there. Uh, the West was threatening sanctions on Russia. So that was one in March. Another was Israel invaded Gaza in, uh, in June. Or July uh, of, uh, of 2014. 
think it was in July, because I got that data just before I went to Las Vegas. So in both of those cases, basically, I can tell you, long story short, that there was a, at, the, at the most critical points in the crisis, there was also a big spike in malware communications between uh, computers, uh, between compromised computers going to Ukraine, to Russia, and to Israel, right? During the, the peak moments of crisis. So, uh, we can talk about it later if you want, but the, the, the point is, is that um, whether it's, uh, it doesn't matter if it's related to denial of service attacks, uh, espionage communication, uh, ongoing operations between <coughs> uh, personnel. Uh, the point is, is it was fairly easy for me to see with such a large data set that national security crises will lead to community to Increased, significantly increased communications between compromised computers, if that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, you can ask about it later. I'll try to rephrase it in a different way. So basically, um, James's chapter on the global context to this is one, one of the things that he says is that as cyber attacks uh, and defense and security overall are integrated into national strategies, uh, you will see reflections of, of national um, associations that will help with the attribution problem. And the attribution problem is a lot of times you just don't know who's attacking you, right? Um, the case with Estonia in 2007, the cyber attacks, largely, people felt like they were unattributable. Uh, but if you look at all the other things that happened around the cyber attacks, the cyber attacks were only one part of a much larger conflict between Estonia and Russia. The chocolate shipments were canceled, the Estonian ambassador in Moscow was attacked, and so many things. Uh, but in any case, you, you can kind of see that, that, that they're associating it um, with, and a little bit more on that later the malware analysis. Um, James Lewis, he's another big character in the United States. He wrote chapter, the next chapter, which is, uh, um, James Lewis also is the, um, the U.S. Uh, expert at the United Nations for something called the Group of Government Experts that are working on developing uh, basically cyber diplomacy, right? Cyber norms during peacetime uh, between, the, uh, between nations. Uh, so he's a very important player, but he, his chapter in particular was on uh, some observe, some way to uh, calculate, calculate the, the effectiveness of cyber attacks. If you look at, for example, is everybody familiar with the Stuxnet attack? I don't know if you are on the Iranian nuclear program. So it is. It is easily, if you're not aware of it, it's the most sort of spectacular cyber attack that, that the world has seen yet. Uh, so what happened was uh, the, uh, the centrifuges that are used in Iran to separate uh, the, uh, the material to make nuclear weapons and to uh, discard the rest, um, these nuclear centrifuges, right? They spin at just the right speed and they're very delicate machines. Um, somebody inserted code into this process so that the machines wouldn't work. Not only would they not work, uh, but they would destroy the machines over time. But they would also, during this process, be telling the managers of the machines that everything was operating fine, right? So with cyber attacks, this is really a challenging time for us, even as human beings, because not only are they sort of a technical uh, marvel, uh, you could attack these machines that are not even connected to the internet. But um, you can actually tell the owners of the machines that everything is fine, right? So this is this is a, a major challenge, uh, you know, for all us from a philosophical perspective. Because there's only really, I guess you could say, uh, three kinds of cyber attacks. One, I can steal your information and read it myself. Two, I can stop you uh, from reading information. So if one's theft, one's denial of service, I prevent you from, from reading communications or, or understanding some information. But the third, the third thing I could do, though, is to change the information so that what you see on your screen is wrong, right? And so this is what happened with, with Stuxnet, but also 
Um, it could happen with stocks. It could happen with, um, you know, communications between you and your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. Somebody gets in the middle of the communication and they change it so that when you read the email, when you read the commentary, uh, it's, it's different than it's supposed to be. And of course, this is the most uh, insidious or difficult of all to understand and to know how to, to respond to. Uh, so anyway, uh, James's chapter is on sort of developing some metrics uh, in this way. Now, from what we have seen in the Ukraine crisis, nothing truly uh, spectacular happened. But as I'll show you later in the presentation, there's almost no aspect of the Ukraine crisis that hasn't been touched by cyber operations as well. And you can demonstrate that too. Um, but, as with Stuxnet, so James is arguing that we uh, uh, need real-world observable effects. Uh, but if you look at Stuxnet, nobody was ever supposed to find out about it. It was always supposed to remain a secret. Uh, so so this, is, this is also a challenge. I mean, if you have a really successful uh, intelligence or military operation, uh, nobody knows about it, right? Uh, and so, except for perhaps the, the, the winner and the loser. So, one of, one of the authors, I had edited a book in 2009, he had written a chapter for it, he called it, we'll see him in a second, he called it Subrosa Cyber Warfare, uh, in which he said that you could imagine quite significant battles in cyberspace take place, but nobody ever knows about it because it's really fairly quiet and it's, um, there's no, there's no way to observe it unless you're the attacker or the defender, but it could still be fairly serious. So there was, there was one case in the United States um, called Moonlight Maze, and that Moonlight Maze was, went on basically from maybe as early as the 1980s and probably still continues in some form today. I think it's largely believed that it's strategic Russian cyber espionage against the United States, but it's probably larger than that as well. Um, the, the, now we're getting better, probably, at this kind of attribution, but in the 80s and 90s it was very, very difficult to know who was attacking you and to trace them back. Um, so with Moonlight Maze, it was a multi-year investigation, many agents and lots of money, and still, that, that's when it sort of dawned on the United States that it was going to be really difficult to know how to stop cyber attacks and how to respond to them. Um, especially the, uh, it also became clear that the strategic or, or the cyber espionage on a daily basis would add up over time, likely a strategic uh, loss uh, of information, potentially even uh, wars in the future. Um, one case was the, the Chinese hacking of U.S. nuclear plans and secrets and designs and, and so on and so forth. Over time, it just became very worrisome that basically the Chinese nuclear program would look just like the U.S. nuclear program because it's very hard to hang on to all this information when you have thousands of scientists working at hundreds of sites around the country. Uh, so here, the RAND Corporation. RAND is probably the largest military think tank in the United States. So he wrote the Cyber War or the Sub Rosa Cyber War chapter for him in 2009. In this case, he wanted to address specifically the idea, uh, the widespread understanding today that Ukraine has counterintuitively not seen uh, much in the way of cyber attacks. Uh, so. Um, basically, he says, look, you have a hot military conflict, a lot of hacker talent, why haven't we seen more? So the reasons he explores there, possibly, uh, Ukraine simply doesn't have enough cyber-enabled critical infrastructure yet. Or, because Russia and Ukraine have largely kept it contained, I think. You know, the, the war, uh, a lot of people in Ukraine feel like uh, the it won't escalate, you know, unless the politicians decide to specifically, uh, and they don't want to currently because they don't have the capability to do more. Um, so, so we'll see. It's, it's hard to know. Uh, but as I'll show you soon, actually, if you can, see, although there's no spectacular cyber attack, one reason I sort of disagree with Martin's uh, uh, thesis in this chapter is, is because. Uh, there's no spectacular cyber attack, but in every case, you can almost see, you 
can see evidence of, of ongoing operations. Uh, but finally, he explores the idea of we just have overrated notions of cyber war. We're, we're used to thinking about it in terms of a Hollywood movie, uh, when in fact, a lot like espionage in general, for example, it probably doesn't look like a James Bond movie, right? But that doesn't mean that espionage doesn't happen on a daily basis. It's just in real life, it's a lot more boring uh, than it is uh, in a Hollywood movie. So, the next two chapters are very important because they're written by Ukrainians and they're written by Ukrainian technical personnel uh, and they establish that we have indeed something to talk about and something to, to discuss. Uh, so this, uh, Nikolai, he's a former head of the Ukrainian CERT or Computer Emergency Response Team. And basically, uh, these two guys have a lot to say. Uh, and the, you know, he says basically, and this, this I like it because it sort of dovetails with my own research uh, over the years. It sort of highlights the fact that um, as political military uh, tension rises, you will see uh, uh, a corresponding rise in cyber attacks uh, because uh, cyber is just something that uh, basically is a part of everything today. So anytime there is an election, a war, a, uh, a major uh, business event, you will see hacking around it, right? Anytime there's money, politics, a military victory at stake, uh, if you just know where to look, as I got with the FireEye data, so I had 30 million callbacks over 18 months, my guess was, in the only the two cases that I looked at, I definitely found huge spikes in malware communications. If you just have the right data set, uh, and you sort of know uh, a good time frame to, uh, to explore, you, you'll find reflection. So in 2000, and basically as the crisis uh, escalated, so did the attacks. So in 2012, you saw a defacement. That's when hackers just changed the text on the site, perhaps, to say something uh, political uh, importance, uh, kind of like with the uh, but in 2013, as the crisis deepened and it was more serious, basically the CERT was discovering uh, new and uh, uh, much more alarming forms of malware that were nation-state oriented, right? So this is important because individual hackers are important, right? You've probably seen movies of lone hackers that are able to to do something, uh, even attack the Pentagon and steal a couple of classified documents. So there's cases, you know, that people feel like the Pentagon is hiding UFO data, for example. There was one famous uh, UK researcher, and he was arrested uh, because he hacked into the Pentagon looking for information on alien beings, right? So, but that's very different, in, even in a group like Anonymous, in which you have a large group that is capable of more because they have a collective of sort of like-minded people. That also is dangerous on a tactical, temporary scale versus a person or a business. Maybe even a government on occasion. But there's a big difference, though, between nation states and everybody else, right? Um, so, you, no person or even group like Anonymous can match the bureaucratic approach of an intelligence agency or a military. These are the these are large organizations that have a mission, a personnel, a large personnel that have different backgrounds, engineers, coders, intelligence personnel. They also get training, retirement, vacations, they get sick leave, they get replaced if they are uh, taking a job, etc. So it's, it's a long-standing requirement, it's a mission. And this is how you know, for example, if a, like if you're an organization that, that is getting attacked consistently over time, the odds that it's a foreign government are, they rise dramatically, right? And it's only logical. Uh, and the reason is, is because no one person or even hacker collective could match that persistence, right? They just couldn't do it uh, because they don't, no one person has that kind of uh, uh, consistency, you know, uh, over time. 
So, uh, so in any case, in 2003, you start to see types of malware that you can associate with nation states, maybe advanced forms of malware that you can also place in a historical context. Um, the timing, the, the uh, recurrence of it, uh, the kinds of things that the hackers are looking for. They are the things that only nation states are interested in, right? Uh, individuals just don't know enough uh, to know for certain keywords, classified terms, advanced technologies. I dealt with this in the US Navy and CIS members, you know. If somebody's searching your network for very obscure code words, you know, the chances that it's a nation state, of course, are already spiral at, at that point. Uh, so in 2014, as the conflict sort of really got more serious, one of the things you saw is the release of, of government documents. Uh, so there were some cases in which the uh, communications of U.S. officials discussing what was going on in Ukraine were stolen, and then they were uploaded to YouTube, they were uh, disseminated via Twitter, and so you see a, a sort of complex way of using the web to uh, run a cyber operation. Uh, but basically, so there's an interplay there between signals intelligence, SIGINT, and, uh, and even Twitter. Uh, the use of these tools to embarrass governments to try and affect what's going on on the ground. Uh, and then the chapter also looks at the most technically advanced attack that they saw, which was uh, uh, in 2014, there was a presidential election in Ukraine, uh, which hackers basically uh, got into and according to the CERT, it was, it was a professional operation. You could tell from every aspect of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, even uh, in, in most countries, you will find you know, these are paper ballots that are counted multiple times. And there's, there's a whole science that goes around election monitoring. So it's not like the hackers could have uh, changed the outcome of the election. But what did happen, though, is that there were um, professional hackers inside the system. Uh, they reported briefly uh, that a far-right leader had won uh, the election in Ukraine, which was not true. Uh, and that fact was immediately um, reiterated on Russian television. Right? So you can kind of see pieces that go together in a hacker operation uh, that may, at the end of the day, only serve to embarrass the country. Uh, in this case, but, uh, but couldn't change the outcome of the election. So um, that will go back to the cyber war skeptics and saying that it's, it's not, uh, you know, cyber attacks cannot change the course of history. But that's, you know, that's unclear. Uh, it's unclear if you, if you really go to the creativity, the hacker, the timing, uh, the investment put in up front uh, to see if it has more than a short term effect. So you might be familiar with some of these scenes in my dog, so this is actually where I live uh, right now. It's very hard to imagine. Uh, when I got there in sort of the summer of 2014, uh, it didn't look quite like this, but it still did look like a uh, the aftermath of a war, really, in all of the Maidan area, if you've been to Kiev. Uh, it's a large Large, very large square. It, it was still filled with barricades and tents, and people uh, people were sleeping outside, and these big uh, cauldrons of food, of soup, that they were making for everybody to eat from, right? Uh, so it was, it was, it didn't look like this, but it was an extraordinary sight. So that went on for two or three months after we lived there, and, and finally the government came in on one weekend and, and cleaned it up in sort of a mass show of force. But um, there's no doubt that these were really historic, truly historical events, I think. I'm not an expert on Ukraine, but basically I think there, there is definitely a sense in Ukraine that, that uh, um, you know, this was a sort of historical event uh, in terms of defining who is Ukraine and, and what uh, will be uh, in the country for, for some time. So this is a researcher who lives, a great guy from the standpoint, not only of technical, but also uh, philosophical uh, interest. So here again, is a very important chapter in the book, because what you see is that, that in every case, so at Euromaidan, when the, the demonstrators were on the street, you 
So basically, every kind of attack, um, there were physical seizures of computers, uh, but there were also remote attacks on, on websites and smartphones and, and certain accounts. And some of the most serious accounts were associated with um, uh, the most serious events. So again, it's only logical, but when the, the shooting started, then they saw a spike in cyber attacks as well. Uh, and it's also the ability to target. So for example, I think uh, it's possible to set up sort of like fake uh, stations that your cell phone will, uh, will communicate with rather than just any station, right? So on particular streets in Maidan, it's clear that the government had the ability to temporarily tell people you're going too far, right? And so if you're in this particular street that was closer, say, to the government um, seat of government, uh, it was, it, there was an ability to send uh, text messages to the cell phones of the people on that street to say, you're going too far, please turn around, go home. Uh, in Crimea, it was more military uh, operation-based uh, activity that was noted. So physically severed network cables, um, even important uh, facilities taken over where, for instance, the uh, Russian government could come near uh, satellites. And even in a softer sense, large-scale changes to Wikipedia during the events meant to uh, to criticize Ukraine and to bolster the Russian uh, perspective on, on, the, uh, on the crisis. And today, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, there's a lot of discussion of, of cyber espionage that having an interplay of signals intelligence uh, in a military sense uh, to aid in targeting uh, Ukrainian military units. Um, so people don't take cell phones to, near to the, the field of battle, for example, because it's, it's well known. Uh, that you can be targeted uh, via pay yourself uh, triangulation. Um, so, in every case, basically, you see that there is a uh, now a, a natural and inherent association between uh, cyber, cybersecurity, information technology, computers, networks, and what's taking place. Uh, so. According to that, also sort of now eastern Ukraine is basically isolated from uh, in the rest of Ukraine uh, in various ways. This also applies to television, for example. So when I, when I moved there, I finally got our shipment from the United States. This was in, uh, I don't know, September of 2014 or something, or 2014. And the, the, I think the day before we plugged in our television, basically, the decision was made to end, basically, television programming. Uh, in Ukraine from Russia, right? So now I've got 100 channels, but really they're all in Ukraine. Uh, whereas previously people watched Russian TV in Kiev, but right? Kiev, the, the language of the people is Russian. You know, Ukrainian is still kind of a project. Uh, you know, people are learning Ukrainian. Um, but uh, most, mostly Russian is the language of the street. Uh, so, but now it's only Ukrainian on the one side, and I think in Eastern Ukraine they're only watching. So here's what I did. Uh, this was a fellow researcher of mine, FireEye. That's actually a map that I put together while I was there for a big report. And it, it is actually malware servers uh, on the planet. Uh, FireEye is a very big company, so they have access to millions of uh, communications every day. Um, but basically, one of the things you can see from the map is that there is no country without malware servers that even one company uh, can has visibility on. I think North Korea was the only country we didn't have malware callbacks to, but that's a pretty isolated country. Um, but the point is there, though, is that you can route your attacks through a different path every day, right? And that creates sort of jurisdictional um, impossibilities, even, for law enforcement. So if I'm an American hacker that wants to get an American bank, you know, I can route my attack through you know, Zimbabwe, Iran, and China uh, one day, and then three other countries the next day. Uh, but these can be countries that my country has poor diplomatic or law enforcement associations with. So they become very possible, very, very difficult to, to trace them back. Um, so Jen looks at the issue of, um, of Russia in particular. 
So the attribution problem is serious uh, in, on the internet, but what you can do is start putting all of your um, evidence into buckets, right? And then the, the, these become sort of collections of, of, uh, of data that you can put into particular what are called campaigns, malware campaigns, uh, that you put into uh, sort of, you can attribute to the countries in some way. For example, if you, if you look at uh, Kaspersky, they do a lot of good reporting, Russian company, on cyber attacks. Um, a couple of years ago, they put out a report, and basically, the, the issue of, um, was that all the victims, they tended to hover around, uh, they were Portugal, Morocco, France, you know, the, the, uh, um, uh, the Basque separatist group. Right? And so, I, I don't believe in, even Kaspersky said so, but the logical conclusion is that the nation state behind the malware campaign is Spain, right? Just from a geopolitical standpoint, those are the targets that Spain would be interested in hacking, right? Um, so, FireEye in this case, the companies now, they're looking more and more at this attribution question and, and uh, doing analysis uh, toward, toward that end. So she discusses the things you can do, but really it's, it's the information gathering on a huge scale that can be used for any purpose, including tactical support to military operations. Um, but a company like FireEye, just like I did with the 30 million callbacks, you can start to understand if you have analysts who know something about what's going on in the world, that's the thing, and that's, that's a sort of opening for a person like me, who just like to follow current events and think about international relations, um, you know, there should be a place in a, in, a, in a malware company or a computer security company because those are very technical people that they're trying to write code and break code and hack into computers and a lot of times they really don't care about what's going on in the real world. They're too busy. You know, they're very, very busy with very technical problems. Uh, so, so Jan looks at the attack infrastructure around the world, specifically related to Russia, uh, um, Tim Maurer, he was at the United Nations, and what he did was look at the, uh, the proxy issue, the non-state issue, hackers, lone individuals, hacker groups, uh, and whether or not they are supporting um, the uh, geopolitical um, campaigns within the conflict. So uh, he has been several times to Ukraine uh, to do interviews, and now he's doing his PhD. Harvard and on this very issue. So uh, what he found, though, was that unfortunately, from, from his standpoint, there wasn't. The information was that criminal groups, at the beginning of the crisis, started to polarize, right? Uh, and I, some, some of the guys I know, too, they said they noticed this in sort of their hacker forums. Um, as the crisis deepened, you could, you could start to see in Ukraine who was Russian and who was Ukrainian, right? Just based on little things, little comments about the conflict, maybe words that they used, different philosophies, or things that they said explicitly. Um, and they hadn't seen that before. Uh, and so that's interesting in the standpoint that you, uh, you know, that the politics couldn't help but be visible even within hacker forums, hacker collectives online. Uh, but according to Tim's research, basically criminal groups had to decide at some point whether politics or, or money was more important if they chose money, right? Uh, that's not to say that they, it will always happen that way or if the crisis deepens that it will, will continue. Um, but one of the interesting things about uh, cyberspace is that you it's kind of borderless nature uh, in the way that plays out. Because in 2003 or four, I wrote a paper on how the Arab-Israeli conflict was playing out in cyberspace. So one of the things you could see is that there was a lot of activity, even coming from the United States, pro-Israeli, pro-Palestinian. You know, these are denial of service campaigns, uh, malware, uh, associated events, but, but the characters are probably located in the United States. And so you could be pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian, but you both live in the state of Texas. Uh, 
Um, you know, but you are basically you can you can affect international relations to some degree from anywhere, right? Uh, so but anyway, in this case, uh, the the issue was to what extent have non-state actors been involved? Because with the Russia in 2007 in Estonia, 2008 in Georgia, there there was this idea of the patriotic Russian hacker that was fighting on behalf of the country. Um, we haven't really seen that in this event, and it's kind of unclear why. There was a case in 2001 when, I don't know if you remember this or not, but there was an American spy plane off the coast of China. Uh, and then what happened, I guess, the Chinese really wanted that plane. So one of their fighter jets actually crashed into the plane in midair. Uh, and forced the American spy plane to divert, because there was no ship around and no island around, to China, and it had to land in China. Uh, so basically, over the course of the next two weeks, the Chinese government took the, they held the crew hostage, and they took the plane apart, and took all of its secrets back to, you know, deep into China. So it was a huge diplomatic crisis between the two countries, but one of the things that happened is that pro-U.S. and pro-Chinese hackers started to fight it out online. Uh, there were there were um, there were these China killer programs, USA killer programs that were out there. Um, and the interesting thing that I, I wrote at the time, I gave a presentation on this at Black Hat Las Vegas, uh, was that you had. Uh, Hackers that didn't have any kind of chain of command or any kind of, they were fighting on behalf of the governments but without, without any um, uh, direction from the government, theoretically. So governments like to have a monopoly on the use of force and a control over the level of uh, tension between countries. And that's one thing they would like to keep for themselves. Uh, but in this case, with the internet available, uh, you have a lot more power than you did historically. As a student, as a person, you can actually write articles and you can upload stories, take pictures that can affect um, international relations if you're a good writer or a good uh, picture taker. Uh, we saw this in the, uh, in the Kosovo War in 1999, in Chechnya before that in Russia. Basically, we, after the internet is in place, you can have people on the ground basically uploading digital photos. They don't have to be real, but some of them are. And what, what happens is you have little people on the ground sort of potentially ruining the day of president and prime ministers by contradicting what they're saying or providing evidence to the contrary. This is really good from a historical perspective because it's good for, I think, in democracy and human rights overall to have little people with a little bit more power because governments are likely to think you know, tell the entire truth about everything. Uh, but here you have more data points to work with and more voices involved in, in activity. Uh, so in this case, I think it's a very important kind of chapter to have. Uh, and one of the questions for the book and for the crisis here is why we haven't seen a little bit more of, of this. And, and the thesis that he puts forth in his chapter is that uh, the crisis is not yet serious enough to draw the uh, cyber criminals in the region away from their day-to-day -day earnings. Um, and so here's uh, our uh, one Russian researcher. Uh, she's actually now at the Swedish Defense University. I wanted more, actually, just so you know, because Krisky agreed to do the uh, write a chapter for the book. It's Krisky Malware Company, but unfortunately, there's a general policy now in NATO not to work with Russian entities of the crisis in Ukraine. So we thought we thought it best to stay away from that. But they were really nice about it, willing to do it forever. Um, but Margarita is Russian and now writes on Russian military affairs from Sweden. This chapter you might find interesting because uh, for Russia, I, I've also been to numerous Russian conferences and international conferences on cybersecurity, and one of the topics that talk about is the, um, the difference in understanding when you talk about cybersecurity uh, with the Russian government. 
So, uh, in general, in the West, if you go to get a big conference in Las Vegas, it's mainly about technical matters. You know, browser security or breaking browser security, um, etc. Uh, but Russian conferences, they tend to talk about information security, right? Which is a much larger concept than cybersecurity. It's not just technical, but it's also cognitive, content related. Uh, and then the criticism over the coffee breaks in the Russian position is that, okay, so you're including information security and website critical of President Putin, right? That's not the same thing as what we're talking about in Las Vegas. You know, we're talking about sort of a zero-day exploit that would give you access to a server uh, you know, from which you could change content in an unauthorized fashion. But that's not the same thing as being a writer or a journalist and writing an article about the President Putin or President Obama. Uh, so these are some of the things that are important to realize and think about when you do international um, cybersecurity events. Right? Because cyber diplomacy is important to do. If every element of what we do uh, is reflected in cyberspace, from military affairs to intelligence to law enforcement to society and student affairs as well, the issue of um, diplomacy is critical. Right. So that's why in the UN and elsewhere, another another group I'm involved with is uh, the OSCE, uh, so the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, and it, it's fun to be a part of that group because Russia. Uh, and the Central Asian states are a part of the OSCE. So you have a larger group of, of, of countries involved. So this is certainly true for any country. Uh, but Margarita specifically points out that you know, for, for Russian um, operators, hacking is just one, one tool in a big toolbox. But I think anyone who knows more about hacking and understands that this is not just true for Russia. And that's one of the things that I think, for, for example, sometimes when you read an article about hacking, let's say in Wired magazine or in a newspaper or something, one of the things that I have often thought, because I come from a government background, is that the journalist didn't really understand or didn't really fully grasp that nations have many more tools than, um, than just hacking via the internet. Right, because uh, you'll hear in terms of sometimes, especially in the past, say, well, it's, it's possible to hack this machine because it's air gapped. It's not connected to the internet or something. Well, an, an intelligence organization is a big deal. You know, uh, you know, the more vulnerable part of the whole, you know, target anyway is the person sitting at the computer. You know, they're vulnerable to, you know, to any number of, of, of attacks. Uh, so, so nations, they understand there's, there's signals intelligence. Uh, from any telecommunications, media, information, intelligence, there's people which are susceptible to bribes and sex and other things. Um, there's supply chain issues in which if, you know, at the Pentagon, for example, if you have to buy a shipment of 5,000 computers for the latest, you know, aircraft carrier, uh, you have to, you know, you have to order these. Where are they made? They are all made in China, right? Um, so don't you think that the Chinese have developed some fairly sophisticated ways uh, to understand when the United States is ordering 5,000 new computers based, you know, for a project in San Diego? They all need to configure it a certain way. You know, they, they can probably guess, you know, on some occasions that these are going to wind up on a warship, right? That's a big challenge for the United States. It's how do they, you know, acquire these things? Made in China that they are going to use to fight a war with China, right? So, um, anyway, so that's, but that's an interesting chapter from, from Russian history. Uh, we have one major researcher who took on the task of uh, looking at the, um, in particular, what Putin and Poroshenko, the president of Ukraine, have said about cyber, uh, uh, cyberspace. I remember in 2008, there was a big event. I actually know the guy. So it's a senior CIA official. And he went to a critical infrastructure uh, event in the United States. And basically, he said, this is no longer science fiction. We are watching foreign governments invade our uh, factories and our electricity grids um, for unknown purposes. Right? And we know they're doing it. And we can see them manipulate uh, uh, not in our country, he 
said, but we have seen them manipulate the electricity supply in other countries. Um, so the important thing there is you get some confirmation, the important point there is you get some confirmation from senior officials uh, that uh, this kind of activity is going on. Doesn't mean they're telling the truth, but we, we look for it. And the reason it's important is because these are often classified spaces that are classified as secret and top secret, etc. So it's kind of hard to know what governments are doing, uh, unless Edward Snowden tells you what they're doing, right? Steals uh, documents that say so. Um, it, I, I'm working on a legal project now. Some of my students at Kia, they do this international moon court team, and they're stuck on this issue. This is funny. Even with the Snowden documents, they can't use them. And they can't use them because the United States government refuses to say one way or another whether they are official uh, U.S. government documents. Uh, and if they don't say so, then you can't use them in court because nobody's owning up to them. Like nobody's saying those are actually ours, which is a very interesting point. I guess you can still try, but uh, in any case, that's what they're stuck with right now. Um, but the, the, uh, one of the interesting things about this chapter is she wanted to see to what extent is cyber attacks or have cyber attacks caused pain or interest to the leaders? So, uh, in the case of, again, there's been a, a sort of a general feeling that cyber attacks have not played a large role in the conflict. At least from the standpoint of Putin and Poroshenko, that is ultimately true. They haven't really addressed the issue, they haven't really talked about it. Russia hasn't talked about it at all. Ukraine is only mentioned in the context of a hybrid. But this idea of hybrid warfare um, that a lot of countries are talking about is it is important because uh, you can see that cyber is just now one element in a larger in a larger toolbox. Social media, this is something so that I like. I'm working with this company actually in Baltimore, Maryland, who does social media threat analysis and doing some writing for them. Um, and the but this is certainly um, an interesting and rich area for research, uh, for you or just to, to, to think about. It. But it, you know, a generation ago, uh, hacking was, you know, computers were large, it might take up this whole stage. And you, you would hack into an important server um, at the Pentagon, let's say, <coughs> you know, to find its secrets. Uh, but the internet has changed almost completely now, and then we're all walking around not a very good phone, but we're all we're sort of walking around with our supercomputer in our pockets, you know, or at least the um, access to the cloud, uh, which is can be just as important, right? Uh, so your your the device that you have in your pocket has not only significant processing power and storage capability, but also connectivity to, to potentially to interesting targets. Uh, potentially to anyone, you know, via, via with, with hacker tools and tactics. So don't underestimate, you know, your own importance in the larger scheme of things. Uh, but because now, sort of, each one of us is wired to such a large degree, we have access to all this information, both to receive it and to send it back to the world. Um, certainly for intelligence collection, propaganda, and psychological operations, there is so much that intelligence organizations, military organizations, could do uh, with that, that, that opportunity, basically. Uh, because at the end of the day, we want to affect hearts and minds, right? Um, there is, you know, just as Sun Tzu said, we would like to win battles before they even begin. Um, you know, but eventually you want to also convince people that your position is and it was uh, correct. And one of the best ways you can do that, obviously, is through social media. The social media, the interesting thing about it is it's a trust-based network, right? So if you get, now spam is suffering because of probably the importance of social media. So it's a, it's a traditional spam, you get some, some email in your inbox from, you know, a prince in Nigeria that's offering you thousand dollars to transfer, you know, thousand dollars to the United States. It's funny how many people fall for that, uh, actually, uh, in the United States. I mean, I, you know, even people, I know one senior government official who flew to Florida once to meet somebody who didn't exist, right? Uh, they 
they felt they had fallen in love with a woman who did not exist, actually. Um, so, uh, and I came across something interesting you might find this interesting too. Why, why are some of these online schemes so outlandish? Why are they so incredibly difficult to believe? You know, you get, a, you get an email which says, I'm a prince in Nigeria and I offer you a thousand dollars to meet me at the airport and do something. And people fall, one of the reasons they are so outlandish is because they really want to find stupid people. Right? They have no interest in you if you're smart and see through such things. Really, really want to find uh, people who will fall for anything. So that's kind of interesting and why some of that exists. But with, and here's the other thing with, um, with the ability to target people, individual people, you're much likely to get responses from computer hacking. Like if, if I ask, you know, one of you in this room, what's your password? I'm, my name is John, and I'm from this. Administration department, and I need your password. But one of you is probably like say, "What? I'm not going to give you my password. I don't know you. I've never met you." But if I send that same email to all of you and say, "I'm John down the hall, and I need your computer password. You know, it's required for rebooting the system." One of you is going to give me your password, right? And so that's that's also part of the trick. Here's another thing. So the um, so, like, take the CIA, for example, or any, you know, foreign equivalent. It's made of people. And these people that work there have families and friends and lovers and teachers and whatever it is. All of these people are vulnerable, too, right? And you can work your way in. And there's been numerous cases, even a couple of weeks ago. So there have been cases, multiple cases, of the director of the CIA um, a few years ago, so five or ten years ago, so his computer at home was his kids were using his work computer for homework online, right? It's true. Um, and just recently, also, a hacker hacked into his own computer. You saw this. Um, but the point is, is that everyone is vulnerable, and everyone is vulnerable to what's called social engineering and hacking, sort of through friends and relatives and acquaintances, conferences. Uh, it's almost too easy to do. So, social media is very, very important, even in a national security context, because of the connectivity it offers, also the ability to gather uh, information. If you can't get to President Putin, maybe you can get to one of his daughters. You know, I'm sure the intelligence folks have thought about that. Um, so, so important in defense. They also discuss offense and defense, and defense is important to, and this applies certainly to the Ukrainian case. You know, the ability to understand and develop, you know, resilient political narratives that you can defend. Uh, there's no end to the online debate uh, <coughs> in the country. So, so some of the things that they have seen are fascinating. Uh, so, for example, there was a fire in Odessa in Ukraine. And there was, then there was a lot of social media criticism of the Ukrainian government for not doing more to save lives and stop the fire. Um, now, with some Ukrainian researchers, they took those social media postings and then they researched the, the, uh, the personalities that, uh, that posted them. And they discovered that these people don't exist, right? So, you can do it by robot, even. Uh, but you can also do it manually. You know, you can, and there's no cost to doing this, really, setting up an online personality profile and then giving your political opinion about anything. And again, some of the impact will go to creativity, timing, etc. So I wrote one article with a real technical researcher in South Africa in 2009 on the topic of whether you could influence elections, right? Doing it totally through robots, um, but just timing it so that uh, it's creative, it's unusual, uh, but also difficult to understand the, uh, the lies and the mechanism behind it uh, in time. Right. So you build up the program, you build up the campaign just prior to the election. Uh, so here is another Ukrainian researcher. She's doing her PhD at the University of Michigan. Actually, I met her here in the Czech Republic. So after my 1986 visit here, I got invited to an event, I don't know, 2012 or so. Um, and she's one of the people that I met. And now she's, she's at Michigan with her PhD. 
speaking on Ukrainian cybersecurity policy. So I said, oh, guess what? We have to write a chapter for our book as well, uh, because we need that. So she was just in, in Kiev in the summer as well, doing, doing uh, interviews for it. Um, but basically, you know, the history of Ukraine from 1991 uh, is uh, underwhelming economic performance, but smart, uh, smart STEM background. And that creates, a, just like in Russia, a difficult environment for cybercrime as well as uh, uh, you know, international jurisdictional issues between, between law enforcement. Uh, so she writes on that if you're interested in development policy. She is following, and, I, and if, if you want, of course, I can give you, I can put you in contact with, with folks if this dovetails with research that you are doing uh, as well. I can uh, so here's our lawyer on the team for the Netherlands Army. And uh, basically, uh, this is also interesting from you know, a historical perspective. The issue of uh, the laws we have currently that exist, they are fine for cyberspace, right? It's just a matter of interpreting them and applying them. Uh, so in this case, you have international law and the law of conflict. This goes to, for example, in Libya, when NATO bombed Libya a few years ago, um, it's still, NATO chose to, to bomb the air defense systems of Libya from the air rather than hack them, right? And so there was a lot of discussion of this in, in the media. But when you're out, it's hack them. Uh, and then some of the off-the-record, I think, response to that was, well, you, you don't necessarily want to one of the one of the officials said you don't want to take out your Ferrari to go to work. Or you, you know that you, Ferrari you save for a nice summer day to drive in the countryside. Uh, meaning that this wasn't serious enough to bring out the most powerful tools. Um, and you don't necessarily like if the United States has uh, sort of air defense suppression hacker tools. You know they're not going to waste them on Libya. You know they're going to save them for a real war. Um, but the point is more important is that if you turn off via the internet a air defense system, you have to pay attention to the laws of war. And you don't want to also turn off the hospital down the street, right? Turn out the lights, uh, because that will be a war crime for which you could be tried uh, subsequently in, in, uh, in war. Um, so International law applies in cyberspace, the law of armed conflict, conflict applies to all cyber, cyber operations. Um, so he goes through some definitions and it talks about some of the issues that, that are interesting to think about, such as uh, Crimea being annexed by Russia. Does that change the, the, um, uh, the nature of cyber operations? It probably does in Russia because uh, in a national security context, things get interpreted a lot differently. I was in this would have been in roughly 1989 or so. I had a, a class in university on national security affairs, and the professor asked us, he said, well, when does, when does the army go to war? When do we go to war? And so we as students were thinking, well, when, you know, when a certain sort of uh, threshold has been met, or when somebody dies, or when Congress, and, and he said, no, 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 all those are wrong. It's when the president decides to go to war, right? So at the end of the day, somebody has to make that really hard decision based on all these uh, uh, complex calculations. Uh, but with, in, in, in Ukraine, now, there's almost certainly a difference between cyber attacks that would take place in Crimea, which has been annexed, and eastern Ukraine, which is still up correct, let's say. Um, but he also says that most known cyber attacks today are just simply not serious enough to be considered uh, within this very important Stuxnet might be different, uh, I mean, the attack on the Iranian nuclear infrastructure. And if you're not aware, sort of, Iran has uh, retaliated, in most analysts' opinion, uh, by um, destroying the data on something like 30,000 computers within the, uh, the Saudi uh, oil uh, sector, as well as targeting Wall Street in New York. That's why we believe it's kind of not entirely known for sure, but those were retaliation for, from Iran for that, for that attack. So today we're working on international norms. What can you do in peacetime? What can you do in wartime? Um, and essentially they should be no different from what you do in real life. But if you've seen pictures of German cities and Japanese cities after World War 
War II, uh, you, get the, uh, you clearly see that when wars start, the objective is to win, right? Even if you have to win at the cost of, uh, of violating certain uh, norms and laws of war. Uh, so uh, my point is there is we really do need to think about this issue. What can you hack and what can you not hack? Uh, both in terms of peacetime and even in the war uh, for you know, the future of the planet. Here's a, a, a Finnish researcher that talks about the regional ramifications, and this would also be a niche technique for the Czech Republic, uh, of the war in Ukraine on other countries. In particular, if you look at Finland and Estonia, their perception of what's happening in Ukraine, and then the way in which those countries are bolstering their defenses. Uh, in uh, response to uh, evolving Russian tactics uh, within the military landscape. Some future conflict scenarios. Um, Jason Healy here on the left was at the White House and now is at Columbia University. Um, and he and his colleague look at the four potential scenarios, so for the future. And this is interesting uh, because one of the things that cyber scenarios look at is whether or not you can just retaliate in cyberspace. Um, like I remember one scenario I ran through some years ago was in 1982, there was a war between uh, the UK and Argentina. And the UK had actually had the uh, Navy to sail all the way to Argentina and fight. Uh, but would, in this day and age, would another way for Argentina be able to fight back simply in cyberspace, attacking the London Stock Exchange? Um, so in the first one they look at, even if the hot war pools could in Russia raise the temperature in the cyberspace, the next uh, couple will look at targeting the West or targeting the internet um, if things got dicey for Russia over time, more difficult. Uh, and then finally, would any country, including Russia, uh, have the ability to knock the internet down altogether? Uh, because if you think about all of the trade and all of the that take place via the internet every minute, every day now, if you were only knock part of that off for a period of time, you would be causing a lot of havoc in the world. Could you do that? Would you want to do that? Well, it might depend if your country has the power to do that, and if it might be in a situation so desperate. Right? And this is the final slide. Really. The last chapter of the book is on strategic advice. Uh, so Richard Baker is a well-known researcher, writer in the United States, uh, on this topic, but he looked, he's written a series of books called the Dow of Computer Security, which some of the technical folks in the room may have on their desk. Uh, and basically, you know, he talks about the, again, uh, at least for nation states, if the, the threat that they face is the opposite, a single event, uh, it, is, it is a strategic problem that requires hiring the right people, putting systems in place, and thinking, you know, in five or ten year uh, time span. Right? So this is this is a little bit different. And it applies really even at the individual level. Because of the, the nature of computer security, how many packets are flying in every direction every day, um, it's not like you can configure a firewall or delete one or two emails and be safe. Basically, this is even for us as individuals Uh, because the computers and uh, applications, operating systems, even in your home, are proliferating the number of devices now, the number of connections to the world. Um, and it's difficult, it's sort of, sort of like a large ecosystem in which you're living uh, on the internet. And it's uh, very difficult to ever say if you do or you don't have security. It's more of a mindset and a philosophy of this initial issue of awareness, uh, just addressing the problem. So thanks. those are all my slides, I think. I thank you for your patience in sitting through. And you can also feel free, I think you can contact me if you have uh, uh, longer-term research questions. Um, and uh, by all means, 